this last few days of International Women's Month and the last few days of Dune 2 Month. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about an influential writer without whom it's pretty safe to say there wouldn't be Dune, the legendary sci-fi novel by Frank Herbert. Now credit where it's due, this came from a conversation with author Aparna Verma who wrote The Phoenix King, a sci-fi fantasy uh, South Asian novel. And she reached out to me with some history of literature questions and of course Dune came up because she had just seen part two, I hadn't yet. And we began talking about it and I started telling her about some of the literature and experiences that helped Frank Herbert create Dune, including a woman who's largely been forgotten. So who are we talking about? Uh, Leslie Blanche, and she's best known as the author of Sabres of Paradise, which is the novel that helped inspire Dune. So Leslie Blanche was a British author born June 1904, and she lived to be over 100 years old, dying in 2007. She was a historian and traveler in addition to obviously being a writer. Her work Sabres of Paradise is a biography of the Imam Shamil, who had struggles with the Tsarist Russian rule in the 19th century throughout Georgia and the Caucasus region. So what I wanted to do was break down more of what specifically in Sabres of Paradise helped influence Herbert Stone. So Sabres of Paradise, as I mentioned, is a story about the Imam Shamil, who was a political, military, and spiritual leader of the North Caucasian resistance to Imperial Russia. He was the third Imam of the Caucasian Imamate, as well as a Sunni Muslim Sheikh. He later went on to earn the nickname and the epithet uh, Lion of Dagestan. So many people often forget that the Caucasus region, which is a transcontinental region consisting of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, southern Russia, and Dagestan, um, they don't understand that a lot of this part of the world is heavily Muslim. So Shamil's life, as detailed in Sabres of Paradise, was lived between the peaks of Dagestan and Chechnya, where the warrior people of that region fought to resist the Russian Empire's advances. The battles that came from this became known as the Marid Wars, the name taken from Shamil's fighters, uh, who are Muslim tribesmen and monks known as Marids. So, Sabres of Paradise focuses on this particular part of his life, where Shamil was helping lead the resistance to fight the Russian Empire, which isn't a surprise that the Harkonnens are a direct analog of. I mean, the Baron's first name is Vladimir. Uh, one excerpt that definitely helps sort of cement and showcase bits from Sabres of Paradise that end up reflected in Paul and his stature and what he becomes in, in Dune is this, um, and I'm quoting here. To Shamil, who straddled these mountains like a legendary giant, they were his birthright, his kingdom. From their shadows, he first unfurled his black standard in the name of Gazavath, holy war. He wielded the dissenting mountain tribes into an implacable army whose private feuds were submerged in their common hatred of the infidel invaders. So Shamil was what was known as Avar, um, chosen in this case of Allah, a messiah. Uh, so for anyone who's read Dune, you can kind of see how they're connected because that's essentially Paul's story. In his case, his story is sort of seeded before he gets there. It's an engineered prophecy spread by the Benedict Gesserit, um, the space witches in Dune, to sort of set him up to be that person. And his coming, and eventually his actions and his choices, help unite the different Fremen tribes against, obviously, the Harkonnens. That's sort of the idea that Sabres of Paradise helped create, the idea of how do you create a, a messiah, a messianic figure, to unite warring different tribes against a certain imperialist structure. And other bits that show up are particularly certain terms, such as Siege and Kinjal, which do show up in the Dune universe. And one quote I want to bring up from Sabres of Paradise is this, The Naibs sleep one by one in the sand, but the Siege endures. And the term siege actually is used to define base camps used by the Cossack tribes who weren't actually the Muslims in the region. So this is something interesting that Frank Herbert took and he adapted to the actual Fremen instead because a siege was essentially a place that you would assemble in times of danger. And it actually comes from the Ukrainian Cossacks. Um, and the spelling for that is a little different, the older spelling of siege, which is S-I-C-H, not, if I remember correctly, S I E. TCH, which is the term Dune uses and is later also used in Sabres of Paradise, um, and essentially describes a chief fortress for refuge. Um, in terms of the Kinjal, this is actually a real weapon, and it's a double-edged dagger used for ages in the Caucasus region, and it's similar to kind of other shorter double-edged straight blades. Um, trying to think, so off the top of my head, like you have the Roman Gladius or the Greek Xiphos, and I hope I said that right, I've actually never heard it said aloud. Um, it's usually a secondary backup weapon. You pair it with the longer reaching one, and then it has certain ceremonial implications, and you would also wear it all the time. So people from the region would actually always have a kinjal on them. And uh, Sabres of Paradise sort of gets into that and the culture tied with the kinjal. And uh, let me see if I can remember this quote, and I have it written down. 
So fighting was life to these darkly beautiful people. The most beautiful people in the world, it was said. They lived and died by the dagger. Battle thrusts were the pulse of the race. Vengeance was their creed, violence their climate. It said that combat was part of their culture and that these people and their boys were trained from a very young age for war. Every boy always had a kindle at his side and was expected to demonstrate sublime artistry. Now that particular bit right there might resonate with people who are familiar with Dune because you're going to remember the quote where Gurney Alec um, is saying that there's no artistry in killing with the tip, that it should be done with the edge. Now it just so happens the actual introduction to Sar Sabres of Paradise begins with to kill with the point lacked artistry. And there's a lot of information out there that suggests this is actually a proverb, proverb from the peoples of the region that we just have been discussing. But the kindle itself has greater importance than just being a knife. Um, and it's because of this and its usefulness and purpose uh, that since it's so tied to the culture that if you're trying to curse somebody and the fact that everyone always carries a kindle with them, you would actually say, may thy kindle rust. And if that sounds familiar, it's because of Herbert's choice, may thy knife chip and shatter. Um, these were obviously very important weapons that, like I mentioned, everybody wielded, including women. Uh, they specifically wielded a smaller one and that these knives were used specifically in a slashing style, not stabbing. Which, historically, if you think about it, that's not always the, the most efficient way to use a dagger or a short blade. Um, a lot of their strength, if it's a straight one, comes from the fact that they're built really to pierce and thrust. And this goes back to the, some of the conversation of the, the artistry behind it and how to use the weapon. And we see that emulated in Dune, where a lot of the fighting styles, and someone can please correct me on this, at least in the, the, the movie version, it seems to definitely take a lot more from Eskrima. There's a lot of quick, short slashes and then hand-to-hand um, -hand combat going in with that goes in with that it's very up close and I'm not sure how much of that actually comes through from Sabres of Paradise that's actually just I think an interesting adaptation from the in the movie version but it does show the history and lineage of some of the things that Herbert drew loving inspiration from that he wanted to show when he created the Fremen culture um, other things I wanted to talk about was that how in writing Shamil, um, it's very particularly focused on the context of who he was, when and where he was, right, in time. And if I remember correctly, there's a part of the, I believe it's one of the earlier chapters that begins with, in the writing of Shamil, we must first place him in his time. And then it goes on to bring up the first half of the 19th century, and then his place within that in the mountains. And Dune also has something similar where there's the earlier parts in the earlier books where it begins describing the history of Mwadweeb and that you must first put him in his time, which I don't remember the exact year, but it, it lists that under the um, the Emperor Shaddam IV and that you also then place him in his place, which was on the planet Arrakis. So there are similarities there too in terms of some of the structure, the wording used, and the presentation of how Paul is already presented to us as a legendary figure, uh, a messiah, of a certain particular place, just the way that Shamil was in Sabres of Paradise. Um, now, obviously, the differences that we have to take into account is the fact that Herbert wrote Paul as a false messiah. Um, I don't remember the year, but there is documentation that he actually spoke at a college also talking about this, that Paul was written to also warn of the dangers of faith put into charismatic saviors, and that Paul is written specifically in a very different lens and regard than uh, Shamil, who was literally considered as a messiah and a savior to these people. Um, other similarities that you sort of see up in terms of the characterization, some of the themes and messages uh, that the readers will see through the characters is in Sabres of Paradise, there's a letter from Shamil to uh, Tsar Nicholas, and it says, This is to tell you that I am determined not to go to Tiflis, even though I be cut into pieces for refusing, for I have oft times met your treachery, and this is all what men know. And in Dune, there's a letter from Leto Atreides to the Baron Harkonnen that also reads, Your offer of a meeting is refused. I have oft times met your treachery, and this is all men know. So there are similarities of how the characters are cast, right? You have, in, the, in this case, it's um, Paul's father instead of Paul himself. But sort of you see the already antagonistic relationship between these two powerful men and leaders and the idea that one's already being labeled pretty early on as people know you're treacherous. People know that you're a backstabber, that, you know, you're clearly casting them immediately as the enemy. Um, other inspirations from the cultural side of things that show up in Sabres of Paradise that you can see mirrored by Herbert are the fact that the Iman Shamil refers to the Russian emperor as Padishah, 
And for people who've read Dune or seen the movie, uh, we know that Shaddam the Fourth is also given the title of the, as the Padisha Emperor. And Sabres of Paradise also features descriptions of um, the Caucasians of the region as eagle-faced warriors, which uh, they have like features prominently even in their symbolism, um, like eagle crests and their faces that mirror things that Paul bears. Because the, if I remember correctly, the actual symbol and crest of House Atreides is an eagle. And then this also extends to mentions of Imam Shamil himself. Through in Sabres of Paradise, it's said he's said to have handsome eagle features. And then this also appears sort of paralleled in Dune, where Paul is said to possess the hawkish features in line with the rest of the Atreides, uh, their lineage. So we see certain symbolization of like powerful bird um, facial structures and features that show up, as well as obviously in Paul's house and crest. And this isn't a full total breakdown. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to turn this into an essay. This was just a very short something that came up out of Aparna, and she thought I should share this for International Women's Month. And obviously, as most of us are all fans of Dune, just showing the cool history of the research and other works that came before Frank that he was able to take from and codify to create such a legendary masterpiece. So I hope that helped open some people's eyes and maybe inspire them to go check out Sabres of Paradise and just see so much of the cool history and work that Frank was able to use to create like the most legendary sci-fi masterpiece out there.